All right, Mark chapter 14. Here's a crazy thought. Here's a crazy thought I want, I want to share with you this morning. Have you ever considered how our assessment of things and what we think about things, what might be good and what might be great or awesome is, is oftentimes far different from what God thinks? What he uses to measure our things that we think are great or awesome are, are probably something completely different from what, from what we use. I mean, we call something, if it's big, it's great, right? If it's big, it's awesome. We think about our, our churches today. I mean, if you've got, you got a big budget, you've got a big staff, you've got a big sanctuary, you've got everything big, then you've got a great church, right? But does God really think that's, that's a great thing? Does, does God really think, you know, what God thinks about it is what's most important, right? And so, I was, and what got me to think about this last Sunday, Brad and Troy and I were standing down here at the front, and Brad was looking at our sound system and our monitors and stuff, and uh, he, was, we were, he was asking, what size are your screens and that kind of thing. I said, oh, our church is doing good. we got 90-inch screens. You know, and I just made a joke. It was just a joke. And I w nobody would ever say anything like that, you know, to be serious because well, we wouldn't, you know, we're, we don't think that. But it got me, kind of got me to thinking, what does God think a good church is? What standards, what criteria does a church have to meet or a person have to meet in order for God to call something, to call something great? Now, so this morning, I want us to take a look at a it's very familiar passage of Scripture in the Bible, a very familiar story to all of us. It's the story of the alabaster box. And there's just three things in this story that I want to point out to you this morning that I believe is what Jesus says is good, right? And so this story, it's found in more than one of the Gospels in the Bible. And we're going to read the account of Mark this morning, but I'll make some references to, to what John has to say about it as well in his Gospel. So Mark chapter 14 this morning, if you'll stand uh, in honor of greeting God's Word this morning, verse chapter, uh, chapter 14, verse number 3. It says, And being in Bethany at, ha at the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at the table, a woman coming at, uh, having an alabaster flask of a very costly oil of spikenard. Then she broke the flask and poured it on his head. But there were some who were in, indignant among themselves and said, Why is this fragrant oil wasted? For it might have been sold for more than 3,000 denarii and given to the poor. And they criticized her sharply. Heavenly Father, we come to you, Lord. We just thank you, Lord, for, for this time we can come together, Father, and we can just open your word and study it. Father, I just pray that you'll open our hearts, Father. Help us to see the things that are here this morning that you want us to gain from your, from your word. Father, prepare our hearts, prepare our ears, prepare everything that everything that's done here this morning, Father, will be in accordance to your will. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, when this woman comes out of the, comes out of the shadows and she breaks this alabaster box, this, this, this flask full of oil and very expensive perfume, she was committing a social sin. Not because she broke something on the floor, not because of anything like that. It was because that women back in those days, and I want to emphasize when I say in those days because I don't want any of y'all women getting on me, but back in those days, women were not to be the center of attention. Women were kind of supposed to hang back in the shadows and they were never to, to call attention to themselves. And then suddenly this woman, Mary, she comes out and, and she does something so unusual, so, so out of the ordinary and so, such a social error that many people began to murmur against her. I mean, she took this flask, this very expensive oil, and she broke it there. And they said that something I read said that this oil was probably worth about $50 in our money today, which constitutes about an annual salary of an average man's working salary back in those days. So we're talking about a, a, lot of, a lot of money here. And she breaks it and she pours it there on the head and the feet of Jesus. And immediately people start to criticize her for that. And I can just see the way it happens. This woman comes rushing through. I mean, they're, at a, they're in a house and there's people all in the house. And this, and this woman comes rushing through, and she takes this oil and this ointment, and she breaks it, and she begins to pour it. And I can just to see people as they start nudging each other. Hey, look, look what she's doing. And, you know, and they hear this thing break, you know, and they're saying, has she lost her mind? You know, and, and they're just, and probably, probably some young people, they're texting each other going, oh, my God, you see what she's doing? You know, and, and so that's, that's what, and Judas said it was a waste. He said it was a waste. He said we could have took that and sold it and give the money to the poor. You know, that, that's what John's account says about it. And so everybody was saying what she'd done was a terrible thing and that she should be ashamed of herself. And I'm sure some of us may even think that today. You may think, well, that was such a waste. Why would, why would anyone do that? And if you think about it, maybe it was. Maybe it was useful. Maybe it was wasteful. Maybe it was, it was impractical what she did. And maybe if she had thought about it a little bit, maybe if she had asked someone else what she should do, maybe she would not have done those things. Of what use was it? She had wasted that perfume. It served no purpose. It didn't feed the poor. It didn't do anything like that. It didn't clothe anybody. It was absolutely useless. Maybe they were right to criticize her. But what does Jesus say about it? What did Jesus say when this woman broke this very expensive oil, this flask, and poured this oil upon him? Well, look what he says there. 
Because I'm, I'm thinking from my perspective, if a woman did that to me in a public setting, I'd be embarrassed. I'd be like, don't make it, stop doing that. But look what Jesus says. He says something absolutely contrary to that. Look at verse 6. He said, but Jesus said, let her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a good work for me. For you have the poor with you always, and whenever you wish, you may do good to them. But me you do not always have. She has done what she could. She has come beforehand to anoint my body for burial. Assuredly, I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to her. So Jesus said, let her alone. Stop, stop criticizing. She's done a good work on me. As a matter of fact, I think so highly of what she's done. I'm going to make sure that it's recorded. I'm going to make sure that it's written down in the gospel and that it, from generations and generations and thousands and thousands of years to come, people are still going to be talking about what she has done. We are never going to forget what she has done. Now, I think that qualifies as good to me. If Jesus says that about me, I'd say that's good, what, what she's done. I thought there's another story in the Bible that I think about that kind of gives us, a, give, gives us a perspective on what God thinks is good. It's the story of the widow's might. The, Jesus was there in the church service. It's time to take up the offering. Back in those days, the ushers didn't, didn't go down the aisles. The people actually came forward and put their money in the treasury. Well, Jesus is standing by the treasury, and he's watching as the people were putting in. And evidently from the text, there were some pretty wealthy people and some pretty big offerings going into the treasury there. And then this widow comes forward. And by the way, if you want to know what a poor person was back in the Bible days, if you want to know somebody who was absolutely destitute, absolutely at the, at the bottom of the barrel, you would talk about a widow. They had nothing. And she comes in and puts something in called two mites, which is actually worse, worth less than a penny today. And you know what Jesus said about that? She gave more than all the others put together. Now, what would we say? Man, we're taking up thousands of dollars here. What are, you gonna, what are we going to do with a penny? But what Jesus says is she gave more than everybody else put together. You see how God looks at things. What calls, but God calls great oftentimes is so different from what we call great today. I often thought it might be pretty, pretty, pretty interesting if Jesus would come forth here today in our service. Maybe we would have the opportunity to ask him about what we're doing here. Does God think what we're doing here is great? I mean, many times when we walk out of the church service, we go, man, that was such an awesome service. That was such a great service. That was good preaching. It was good singing. The screens worked right. The music worked right. Everybody did what they were supposed to do. And it was such a great service. But what would God say? What would Jesus say about what we're doing here today? The point I'm trying to make is this, that the criteria by which your life and my life is judged is not what you think of it and not what people say about it, but what does Jesus have to say about it? What does Jesus say about your life? What is, does Jesus say that you're doing a good service, as he said to the woman who anointed his, hair, his head with oil? You see, I think it should be the heart. It should be the desire and the heart of every Christian to want God to be able to say that about them, that he has wrought a good work on me, or she has wrought a good work. That should be our desire, to please our Lord and Savior with everything that we do. You say, so can God say that about you today? You have wrought a good work on me and wherever this gospel is preached it's going to go on for generations and generations now i want to talk to you today about how we can have that type of commendation how god and how jesus could say that thing about you so what is it that pleases jesus what do we have to do to please jesus how far do we have to go how much sacrifice do i have to make in order to have the lord say i am pleased with what you have done how much do we have to do how much do we have to to give in order to have the Lord's commendation, in order for the Lord to be able to say that about us. You say, what do I have to do? Three simple things from this passage this morning. First of all, do what you can. Do what you can. Look at the first part of verse 8. Exactly what Jesus says. She has done what she could. She has done what she could. It's just, it's just as simple as that. So what is it that constitutes a good service? What is a good preacher? What is a good music minister? What is a good Sunday school teacher? What is a, a, good, uh, a good deacon? What is a good church member? What makes a, something good when we call it good? What makes it good? Jesus says this, just do what you can. Just do what you can. And that was all it took to please the Lord. Other people were in the house that day. They saw exactly what Jesus saw. They were criticizing, making fun of her, you know, and bringing her down for what she was done. He said, let her alone. She has done what she could. As a matter of fact, it seemed to me like it was a total waste of money. That's just the way that I look at it, but that's not the way God looks at it. Because God oftentimes looks at things way more differently 
than we do. Jesus says, I don't judge people by how much they do or what they do. I judge them by the opportunity that is placed within their hands to do what you can do. Just do what you can do. Now, this same event is recorded in John's Gospel, chapter 12. And you don't have to turn there. You, I'm telling you, it's in John chapter 12. Just take my word for it. And in, in chapter 11, we see Lazarus being raised from the dead. Now, Lazarus was Mary and Martha's brother. And so John makes very careful, uh, makes, makes very, uh, is very careful to, to mention the fact that Lazarus is there in the house. And so what I think is going on is there's a celebration going on in Martha's house. There's a celebration going on. What would they be celebrating? I mean, their brother was dead for four days and Jesus raised him from the grave. Wouldn't you want to celebrate about that? And so they're celebrating that Jesus has brought their brother back to life. Now, when you read scripture, you read a lot about, or several times we read about Mary and Martha. Now, Martha seems to be the talented one. Martha seems to be the one who has the gift of service and being able to do all types of, she's just kind of talented. She's always in the kitchen, always serving and doing, doing things. Mary kind of stayed in the shadows. Mary didn't have the gift of cooking. Evidently, she wasn't a cook because it never says anything about her being in, being in the kitchen. But, Mar but Martha is in the kitchen and she's cooking. She's going to show her gratitude for the Lord for what he has done by cooking a meal and maybe by serving him in some way. But Mary has that same love. Mary has that same appreciation. She wants to show that affection in some way, but she doesn't know what to do. She has no, she has no idea what she can do to show that same love that she has. And I can almost see her panicking. She's like, what can I do? I don't know what I can do. And so she goes to the back, and she gets this flask, this very expensive flask of oil. Maybe she had it put back for a special day. Maybe for the day when she gets married. Maybe for a day when she falls on hard times. Maybe when she's older in life, she may need that. But she goes back into that hope chest or that closet or wherever she has that oil, and she brings it out, and she runs through the crowd, and she breaks that flask, and she anoints the head and the feet of Jesus. You see, Mary's heart was just as full as Martha's. Mary wanted to show that same love, that same gratitude, but she didn't know how to do it. So what did she do? She did what she could. She did what she could. You see, love has to do something. Love can't just sit idly by. Love has to do something. And that's what our service for the Lord is. It's nothing more than an overflow of the gratitude that we have for what God has done for us. It shouldn't be that we have to drag ourselves out of bed to get up and serve the Lord. It should be that I get to get up because of everything God has done for me, everything that Jesus has done for me, besides being on the cross, besides dying for my sins, everything else that he's blessed me with, shouldn't I want to serve him? Shouldn't I want to worship him? Shouldn't I want to praise him? Obviously, we should because of everything that he has done for us. And no Bible scholars ever came up with a good answer where she got this from. She don't, nobody knows where that per, per, of a perfume came from, but she goes and gets it. A very, very, I want you to understand how expensive this was to her. It was her treasure. And she gave it up and she poured it on the head and the feet of Jesus. And this is what Jesus said. I like what she's done. I like what she's done because she's done what she could. You see, all God demanded of her was to simply give back what he in the first place had given her. And the Lord demands nothing more from you than, than he himself has given you in the first place. That's all God demands of any of us. What he has given you, that's what he demands back. Now, I know in our contemporary Christian churches today, it seems like we sit back and we worship and we magnify and we exalt the talented people, right? I believe 90% of the church probably sits out there on Sunday morning looking up and they're almost like stargazing. They're going, man, I wish I could sing like that. Man, I wish I could play the piano. Man, I wish I could play the guitar. Man, I wish I could speak. I, I wish I could just do something. What can I do? You know what Jesus is saying to you? Do what you can. Do what you can. Give me what I've given you. That's all I'm asking. That's what Jesus is saying to you today. The only thing that God expects from you is this, to do what you can. Now, you say it may not be much. You say it's not much. Let Jesus decide that. Let Jesus decide what, what is much. You see, God said to Moses after 40 years of being in the wilderness tending sheep, Moses at one time was a prince. He was the next in line to be, to be the Pharaoh in Egypt. He was stripped of all that. And 40 years he spent out in the wilderness and God appeared to him. And he goes back into Egypt and he has that staff. He has that rod and God says, what is that you got in your hand? He says, nothing. It's just a rod. God said, throw it on the ground. And he gave that rod to God. You know what God did with that rod after that? He parted the Red Sea. You know what else he did with it? He defeated many of Israel's enemies. He performed many, many miracles with this, with this simple little shepherd's staff, this simple little rod that was given to God. You give your gifts, 
You give your talents, you give whatever it is that God has given to you, you give it to God and let God work many miracles with that that he has given to you. David and Goliath is the same way. David walked out in that army with, with that, on that battlefield with a slingshot and five stones. And look what God did. You see, you just give it to God. You give it to God. The widow in the Old Testament, and there she comes to Elijah. She's broke. Her husband has died. She's got this great debt she needs to pay. And people are coming trying to take her kids from her to, to sell them into slavery to be able to pay for that debt. And she doesn't know what she can do. And Elijah says, what do you have in the house? She goes, I got nothing. I'm flat broke. The only thing I've got in that house is a little pot of oil. Elijah said, go get that pot of oil and go tell your sons to go to the neighbors and get some pots, get some vessels. And, like, and I like what the Bible says. The Bible says don't just get a few. That means get a lot. And they bring all the pots and pans from the neighbors' houses and they bring them over there and they begin to pour them. And they begin to pour them and they begin to pour them. And all those pots and pans were filled with oil and they were able to sell that oil to pay off that debt. You see, God can work a miracle. It was the simplest of things. You say, it's just a little pot of oil. That's all, that God, that's all I've got. Give it to God. It was so simple, it was so, uh, she was almost embarrassed to mention it. But she gave it to God. She was obedient, and she gave it to God, and God worked a miracle. See, another story is Andrew, when, he feeds the, when, God, when Jesus feeds the 5,000. Andrew says something that, that really sticks out to me in that, in that passage of Scripture. You got all these people out there, 5,000 people. They're out there, they're starving, they're hungry, they're way out in the middle of nowhere. And Andrew comes to Jesus, and he says, here's a lad here with a little lunch that his mama made him. But what is that among so many? Have you ever thought about, have you ever, have you ever felt that way? What am I among so many? What can I do when, you, when you've got people who've got all these talents? It's, what can I do? Jesus says, do what you can. That's exactly what Jesus says. Whatever God places in your hand, that's all he demands of you. So I can say, Lord, demand what you will as long as you provide what you demand. And I promise you, God will. God will give you. God will never demand more than he provides, and he will always provide exactly what he demands. You do what you can do. Now, that may not seem too much. It may, it may seem like you can't do that much, but again, let Jesus decide that. Let Jesus decide. Everybody in that room thought what that woman was doing wrong, but what did Jesus say? Let her alone. She has done what she could. So first of all, you do what you can. Second of all, you do all you can. Don't just do what you can. Do all you can. Look at the last part of verse 3. It says, Then she broke the flask and poured it on his head. You see it there? She broke it. She broke You ain't got, but you break something that's got, got liquid in it, you ain't got no choice but to use all of it. And she poured, she broke that flask, and she poured all, she wasn't just taking a spoon and measuring out a little bit to dabble on Jesus at a time. She broke the flask. She gave everything that she had to Jesus. You see, in the back of her mind, there could have been the thought things might get bad one day. Things might get tough. I might need that when tough times fall. I may need to sell that so I can live. There, there may be a time when I'm going to need. She didn't give any thought to that. She didn't think about anything like that. You know, sometimes love is reckless like that. Love is reckless like that where we're casting everything else aside. I can see this woman as she's coming through the room, and all these people are probably looking at her like she's crazy. And in my mind, she ain't worried about nothing else that's going on. The only thing she sees is Jesus, and he, he raised her brother from the dead, and she wants to show him gratitude. What has God done for you? Hasn't he raised you from the dead? Don't we sing that song that I ran out of that grave? Shouldn't that be enough that we can praise God, and we can worship God, and we can serve God for all that he's done for us? You see, that's what Jesus has done for, and for us, and that's what, he, what she has done for him. You see, I'm convinced that God doesn't judge me on the basis of what I've done, but on what I could have done. He doesn't judge me as much on what I have done, but what I could have done. He doesn't judge me as much on what I have become, but what I could have become. He doesn't judge me on, on as much as, as, as what, I, what I've accomplished, but what I could have accomplished. And I know it's kind of out of the ordinary for a preacher to stand up behind the pulpit and to confess sins, but I'm telling you here this morning, I believe the greatest sin of my life it's not what I have done, but what I could have done. What I could have done if I had given everything, all of my life to Jesus every single day of my life. That's why Paul says, I die daily because we've got to give it to him all every single day of our lives, and we've got to give it all to him. Don't just measure out. Don't give God your leftovers. Break it. Pour it all out on Jesus, everything that he has given to you. You see, you see is Jesus satisfied with what you're giving him? Are you just measuring, giving him a little leftover, giving him just a dabble in just a little bit of time? Is Jesus satisfied? You see, there's a tendency in my life, and I'm sure probably some of you as well, there's a tendency just to do just enough to get by. 
just enough to get by. I, I know I've been teaching Sunday school for probably 20 years now. Been doing a little preaching, and sometimes this is the thought that I have in my mind. If I can just do enough to please the people. Will the people be satisfied when I teach this lesson? Are the people going to like what I have to say? When I preach this sermon, is, is, are the people going to be satisfied? That's not important. Is God satisfied? Is Jesus satisfied with what I'm doing? Do we need to get into the Word and find what God has to say for us? And when God has said it to us, then we can overflow it out of our mouths into the lives of others and let God be satisfied because He's given it to us. And we've given it back to Him, and God is going to bless it and use it as He sees fit. So you do what you can. You don't just do what you can. You do all you can. Then thirdly, you do it while you can. Look at verse 7. For you have the poor with you always, and whenever you wish, you may do them good. But me, you do not always have. Now Jesus said, let her alone. Jesus said, stop picking on her, stop criticizing her. She has done what she could, and then he makes a very strange statement. He says, she has come to anoint my body for the burial ahead of time. Now that's kind of interesting to me right there. Jesus wasn't dead. He wasn't even sick. And yet she's anointing him and getting him. She's, he says that, that, that she's getting his body ready for the burial. Now, how would you like for me to come up to you after church this morning and say, hey, if you got a little time this evening, I want to go with you and help you pick out your casket. Same kind of weird, wouldn't it? But that's, what, that's, what, that's what's going on here. Jesus says, she's anointing my body for my burial. You see, that's, why would he say that? Why would he say that? Well, if I have my timeline right, this is on a Tuesday. This is all happening at a, at a gathering, at a social gathering on a Tuesday. Guess what happened on Friday? Jesus was hanging on the cross. You don't always have me. That's what he said. You can, you can do the good for the poor anytime you want to, but I'm only here for a short time. And if you had been lurking outside the sepulcher on that first Easter Sunday morning, you would have seen those women coming down this dark, dim trail, headed to anoint the body of Jesus. And you could talk to those two ladies, and you would say, where are y'all going? They said, we're going to anoint the body of, of our Jesus. He was crucified a few days ago. And the Romans were so worried that someone was going to steal his body, they wouldn't let us anoint his body. And so they put him in the tomb, and they sealed the tomb, and they've got Roman guards standing by. But we want to go and see if we can talk one of those Roman guards into rolling that stone away so that, so that we can anoint his body. It's not right for him to be buried there without someone putting some spices on his body while he's laying there in that grave. And so you could fall in behind those ladies as they go to the tomb there. And when you get to the tomb, it doesn't take long to figure out you're not going to have to talk anybody into rolling that stone away. It's done being rolled away. And you get into the grave there, and you see Jesus is not there. He's not there. And you say, well, I was going to anoint his body. I've got these spices. I've got everything that I was going to anoint his body, but he's not there. It's too late. It's too late. He's gone. How many times have we let opportunities pass us by? God has led us to do something. God has given us something he wants us to give to someone else. And yet we put it off, and we put it off. We say, I'll do that next week. And next week never comes. We don't have that opportunity. When God lays something on your heart, do it now. Do it while you can. Do it while it's fresh on your heart because God has laid that on your heart for a reason and it's because it has eternal implications. You see, they would never have... If, if Mary hadn't done what she did on Tuesday, she would have never got to do it. She would have never got to do it. How many times in my life have I done that? God has laid something. I'll do it later. I'll do it tomorrow. I'll do it next week and that never gets here. You see, we need to do it while we can. You see, what, whatever God is leading you to do, do it now. You see, that's what we're doing here in this life. As Christians, God has made us disciples to tell others about Jesus. And when we tell others about Jesus, what are we doing? We're preparing them for death. We're preparing them for eternity. That, that's what, that's what when I know we're supposed to prepare people to live too, but we're really preparing them for death. How they're going to spend eternity has, has eternal implications of how, how we act around them, how we talk to them, how we share the gospel with them. That has eternal implications. And we say, I'll wait. I don't want to talk about that today. Now's not a good time, but tomorrow may be too late. You see, the thing that sticks out to me is Jesus said, she has anointed my body for the burying. Now notice what Jesus said was simply an uh, interpretation of what she said. I think Mary was as surprised as anybody was. When Jesus said that, I'm sure she was taken back. Wait a minute, I didn't do that to... You know, I don't think she understood what she was doing. She didn't understand that she was anointing Jesus' body for death. I believe she was taken back just as much as anyone else. So that teaches me that sometimes when God tells me to do something, I don't have to understand what He's telling me to do. I just need to be obedient and do what He says do. Just do it on faith. 
just step out and say, because God told me to do it, I'm going to do it. I feel led to do it, I'm going to do it, because I know God would not have laid this on my heart if it didn't have eternal implications on someone else's life. See, I'll tell you, folks, a lot of things God asks us to do, we don't have any idea of what we're about to do. We don't have any idea, but God does. And we need to act out of obedience, out of God's, out of God's Word. I think someday we're going to stand in His presence. And we're going to see something. We remember God told us to do something. It may be something as small, as small as small can get. And we're going to say, I did that, and that person's here because I was obedient to God. Or it could be the other way around. I didn't do that, and that person's not here. You see, it always, when God leads you to do something, we have to do it and do it while we can. Now, the reason I pointed out this morning there were, that there is more than one account of this event is because Mark said that she anointed his head, and John says that she anointed his feet. So which one is right? I believe it's both. I believe it's both. I believe she anointed his head and his feet. Some people say she poured so much on his head that it ran down on his feet. Either way, I get the picture of her breaking that flask. And, the, and now then she run out in such a panic she wasn't prepared and she anoints his feet there and there's so much oil that she, she doesn't have a towel because she's not prepared. She didn't know what she was about to do. She was in a panic and she breaks it there and there's so much there that she gets down on her knees and she takes her long hair and she sweeps it around over her shoulder and she turns her hair into a towel and she begins to clean up and she begins to wipe down the feet of Jesus with her hair. You know what the Bible says after that? That the whole room was filled with that fragrance. You see, what she poured out on Jesus was now poured out on her. And I can promise you this morning, whatever you pour out for Jesus, he will pour back on you. I can promise you that this morning. It will, your, your life will have that fragrance. Have you ever been around someone who's been in the presence of Jesus, who's living in perfect obedience to God, that they have that fragrance, they have that sweet smell, that sweet savor on them knowing, of knowing that they're doing, they're just in the presence of God to have that glow about them. That's what we see here. Whatever, when we break our lives, when we pour everything that we have out to God, we have that sweet fragrance in our life. You see, the Scripture says that the house was filled with that fragrance. And what I want to say to you is this. Whatever you pour out on Jesus will always come back to you. You see, Jesus is simply saying this this morning. Do what you can. Just as simple as you can. It could be the simplest thing. You do what you can. And second of all, he's saying, do all you can. Pour it all out. Break it down, give it all to God. And thirdly, he's saying, do it now. Do it right now.